Okay, um, I'm here with uh, talking to Weston Oaks, who is the Bram Stoker Award winning uh, novelist of um, Scarecrow Gods, the SEAL Team 6 series, and most recently the um, Grunt Life uh, books. Um, a Task Force, it's Ombra, right? Is the name of the novels? Task Force Ombra novels? Yeah, Task Force Ombra. Yeah. And um, I, the reason why we're talking um, right now is because I just finished reading Grunt Life and um, I'm starting to do more interviews to go with my book reviews. And actually, you're gonna, I've already done one other interview, but you're going to be the first one I put up. So, All uh, right. Yeah. And, um, but I've, been, I've done over 500 book reviews on my blog, so um, this is the second one with audio um, features. But I'm really excited to talk about this book. Um, I'm a huge military sci-fi fan, um, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to get into this book. And so one thing that I thought was really interesting about Grunt's life as far as uh, military sci-fi is you don't hide the fact that this is in the tradition of military sci-fi so much to the fact that the characters actually study military science fiction um, in their training. And I thought that was a really interesting decision. So that's going to be one of the first things I want to talk about. But do you want to just give um, listeners a, um, a background on where this idea came from and um, how Grunt Life got started? Okay. Uh, well, Grunt Life got started... Um, when I decided I wanted to write a military sci-fi series that dealt specifically with PTSD. There are so many books out there, stories out there, movies, TV shows, where a PTSD sufferer is portrayed in a negative manner. And I wanted to get rid of that um, cliche. I wanted to show them really how they really are, just people, you know, with, who are broken and who have problems. Um, we all have a little bit of PTSD if you think about it, you know, whether whether I was changing lanes, going on the highway, flying in the airplane. You know, PTSD, as Mike Cole said, is like the weather. Anybody can encounter it. You can encounter it on the way to, to work. If, if there's a traffic accident, you look over and you see a dead body, God forbid. Uh, that image will stay with you. And it's what your mind does to compensate that, that basically causes you to do things that you don't normally do. Um, so I wanted to write... Uh, very deep, very in-depth characters, and have each one with different PTSD issues, so that uh, perhaps if somebody reading it um, had PTSD or knows somebody who has PTSD, it's more easier, easier to relate. Does that make sense, David? Yeah, it does. And one of the things that is so neat about Grunt Life and what worked about it was because everyone's been looking over the years, like you know, kind of one of the standards of military. A military story is like the dirty dozen, right? You mm -hmm. have like the criminals who are who have to fight the mission, and so they have this really cool arc because like they're trying to get their freedom. And what I thought was so neat about Grunt Life was that you had such a unique way of of spinning the dirty dozen idea because every single person that was on this team. Um, was specifically there because they were traumatized. <laughs> and that, I know. Yeah, and that gave them a special edge up. Um, and uh, just that right there, uh, the kernel of the idea to me was so brilliant. And, um, and, and what I thought was so genius about, because, you know, it's hard after Old Man's War and uh, Starship Troopers of Forever were all these classic military sci-fi books to have something that was original and different was, um, was what I was so impressed with. Amen. I, I did not want to um, copy those books, you know, as, as we'll talk about in a minute. I, I gave them homage, definitely. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to, to do something new, something interesting. Let me ask you, David, as far as the military sci-fi books you've read, how is this book rate on a darkness scale of 1 to 10, or a bleakness scale? Hmm, on a bleakness scale, pretty high up. <laughs> um, you know, I would say probably in Forever War territory. <laughs> um, all right, all right. 
Because one of the things that makes Forever War such a um, great, you, you know, like Old Man's War is one, is awesome. I love it. I think it's one of the best 21st century sci-fi novels. However, it's very funny at times, <laughs> and right. it's very lighthearted at, 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 at given times, and I think Scalzi's good at that. But Forever War is a true war novel. It just happens to be science fiction. And one of the, the things about, like, the time dilation in Forever War gives it a certain darkness because the warriors, like, once they head off to war, like, society is always different. They can never come home. And I think that's the meaning of the title, Forever War, if I'm correct. It is. I've, I've talked with Joe Haldeman about this book, and, you know, he, he wrote it right after he returned from Vietnam. So he... He had on his mind the idea that, you know, here's this war that I just came back from fighting that's never going to end. And even as I've returned, the people and the place I left are different. And I think he really captured that in uh, Forever War. Yeah, and which is cool because in this vein, and one of the reasons why Forever War is one that I kept thinking of is, is that Grunt Life specifically deals with issues that soldiers from our current conflicts are dealing with in much the same way that the soldiers who were involved in Vietnam Forever War spoke to them, you know, and, and, and I think that's really cool. Now, specifically, this is not your first military um, fiction. You've done this, the SEAL Team books. Um, was there... Um, Themes. I, I've only read the first book of, of that series so far, too. Um, I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna go on a binge here and read all the rest of yours. But um, but it didn't seem to me that it had such a theme. It was such a great story. I loved SEAL Team Six Six Six, but um, it didn't seem like it had quite the theme that Grunt Life did. No, I don't think I, I captured the same gravitas. Um, I think with the with the triple six books, I was I was trying to um, um, do something fun and scary at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably why The Rock um, has has signed on to to do the movie version of of six 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 because he he kind of sees that it as a as a, something that that he can do. It can be serious, but he can, he can also be funny. Whereas, you know, the Gret series, you know, there's there's joking amongst amongst the uh, the soldiers and marines and, and whatnot, but but that's all gallows humor. That's normal soldier talk, and, and although it's funny, it, it doesn't have the same same tinge as uh, SEAL Team Six Six Six. Right, which is which are is a really fun book, and in, in many in many ways, but um, has a great arc too. Um, but we're we're going to focus on grunt life, grunt life today. Um, so in all the books that. So let's talk about how you um, play homage to the to the other greats of military uh, sci-fi. Sure. Um, so let me jump in. Um, yeah. So I um, there was so much I wanted to do, but there's so much that's already been done, right? Right. And uh, I kind of wanted to come out and just say it that that you know John Stakely wrote Armor, and and it exists in this world, and people have read it. Right? right? Joe Haldeman wrote The Forever War. It exists in this world. People people have read it. It's like whenever you see a zombie movie, suddenly people are like, oh shit, what's that? You know, It's a zombie, of course. It's like they're acting like they don't know what it is. Because the, the writer didn't have them existing previously in that world, which I think is is very un, unreliable for a, mm -hmm. for a narrator to do. Um, so I wanted um, uh, all these books to exist in the world. When I was in the army, I used to read these books. I read Armor when I was in Mechanized Infantry Brigade. I mean, it's it's something that just people did. Um, mm -hmm. And then I wanted to take it a step further. I wanted to make them study guides. Because I figure with all the tomes and wealth of information that we have out there from from awesome authors like David Gerald and Robert Heinlein and, and Ray Bradbury and all the ones we've talked about and even more, um, wouldn't you think that reading those could could be a, a, a school of, of what to do in the event of alien attack. Because what you're doing is you're reading lessons learned from how other authors either fought and won or fought and lost. And then you can apply those lessons learned on the battlefield. I mean, in the military, 
Um, after everything we do, we have what's called an AAR, which is an after action report, which, which you try and capture those things that you did good, and you promise to do them again, and you try and capture those things that you did bad, and you try and never do them again. And this is what those books meant, meant to the um, members of Task Force Ombra. And just, just to let the readers know, um, every member of Task Force Ombra is forced to read these books and critically think about them and critically talk about them, um, just like they were in a, uh, a third or fourth year college course mm -hmm. to demonstrate that they had understanding. And they, and they had to do this or else they wouldn't be released from jail. So. Right. And so we already talked about the Forever War a little bit, but um, uh, Benjamin Mason, who's the main character, he he chose the Forever War as his favorite, really. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that was um, partially, um, you know, because it was probably your favorite, <laughs> I'm assuming. Or it, is, it is one of my favorites, and that was definitely a, a, a hat tip to Joe Haldeman. Yeah. And did you talk to him before you wrote the book, or uh, I talked to him? About? I talked to him several years before I wrote the book. Um, mm -hmm. I got a book from Nightshade. I, I got a, a copy of uh, War Stories from Nightshade Books, mm -hmm. and it captures a lot of his short fiction in novellas. In the, and I had never read Joe Haldeman to my to my disgrace, um, mm -hmm. and I didn't get that until about two thousand two, two thousand three, and then. I was told by Jeremy there at Night State Books, he said, well, you have to read it forever. So I went up and got a copy, and I was like, oh, my God. So there was a convention up in Phoenix that I, I wasn't going to go to because I didn't have enough time, but they said Joe Haldeman was going to be there. They asked if I would come, and I said, I will come on one condition if I can interview him and then go out to dinner with him. And they said, okay, then 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 you're invited. We'll pay your way, blah, blah, blah. So uh, – I, I totally enjoyed meeting him and his wife Gay and going out to dinner with them and talking about, you know, just the impact of war and writing and, and things like that. And uh, I really wanted wanted you know give him that kind of tip tip of the hat because, you know, it's one thing for for guys like me and some other guys who really haven't been to a war like Vietnam to you know write books and stuff. But for him to experience, you know, some of the shit that he experienced and then, you know, be able to frame it in such a way that it is enduring um, is sort of magical. Yeah, I mean, I read it um, when I was too young to really get it and then came back and read it as an adult. Um, and uh, but you think about, you know, even when I was a teenager uh, in the early 90s and somebody's, you know, my friends who are into science fiction are saying, you got to read The Forever War, <laughs> you know. And I wasn't really ready for it. But, um, all right, so any last comments before we get into spoilers and get into the actual writing of the book? No, I just, I just want people to know that um, if they're expecting um, uh, a book where a bunch, of, a bunch of humans are able to soundly and easily defeat the incoming alien invasion, well, this is not that book for you. No, no, it is not. Um, it's not Welcome to Earth with a punch <laughs> by, yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> I don't think anyone would say that after reading the book. Um, yeah, okay, so let's, uh, let's get nitty-gritty about some of the writing. So um, the book was in um, first person um, um, mo almost, I believe, entirely through um, Mace, uh, Benjamin Mason's eyes. And it's, it was entirely. Yeah. 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 And um, so that creates interesting things. Well, first of all, the book begins with his suicide attempt, right? And, um, right. Yeah. And uh, so that's an interesting place to start with character. But by being first person, um, it definitely put the, kept the story from being too global. Um, because you're always in his perspective. Um, ah, see, you're you're onto my technique here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I thought a lot about that in in the book because I know um, I remember when Stephen King put out Cell, he said he was inspired by Spielberg's War of the Worlds to get rid of all the scientists, world leaders, and all that stuff, and just focus on you know one group of characters. Mm -hmm. And and so through the uh, task force Ombra characters, but 
specifically through the first person narrative, um, we don't see a lot of what happens with the global invasion. So one, um, obviously you're saying that's intentional. Um, what are the strengths of doing that? And then have you ever considered writing short stories or stories elsewhere in the Cray invasion? So I've written a, a, a 20,000 word novella um, that I'll, I'll send to you. Um, that was published in the Cohesion Press book. Uh, it takes it bridges books two and three. Awesome. So, uh, and it's called "What What Would William Shatner Do?" Um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> based on a game that he and, he and a girl used to play. When whenever they would come up with a, with a question, they would say, "What What would William Shatner do?" And then they would do it. Um, uh, but the the strength of first person is this. Now, there there is no more. Um, there is no more internet, there is no more telephone, there is no TV, that's all gone, right? right. So, so I'm, I'm sure there are generals out there who, who, who probably know what's going on, and, and, there's, and there's some government leaders who know what's going on, but let's face it, um, Ben Mason and his people, they are, uh, they are grunts, and the grunt is the lowest of the low, and, and that's why I called it grunt life, because mm -hmm. it's basically... Uh, grunts are mushrooms. They're kept in the dark and they're fed shit. That's it. And until they're needed. And then, and then when they're needed, they they come out in in the light. They're pointed in a, in, in a direction, and that's where they go. Um, so it was intentional like that because there's a frustration in being a grunt of, of not knowing what's going on, of having to depend on somebody else telling you. You know, the 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 scene when 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 the attack finally happens and they're underground and they don't know what's going on and things are crashing and falling. They're terrified. They don't know what's going on. You know, they have, they 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 think they know something, but they don't. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the weaknesses is this is what the publisher said to me. He said, "Weston, we don't know what's going on." I said, "I know because the main character doesn't know what's going on." Isn't that frustrating? And he's like, <laughs> yeah. "Yes." Well, so what I so what I did, yeah. So at the beginning of each chapter, if you know, I have either a quote. Or I have a broadcast from a fake broadcast, where uh, the quotes, each quote has to do with something specific to that chapter, and then the broadcast um, from this uh, from this radio show that I invented are kind of are kind of like a little thread to tell you, you the reader, what's going on outside of uh, Ben Mason's POV. Right, and it's funny you read my mind because that was my next question was going to be the quotes. Um, <laughs> Because it seemed like that was the technique you used to. Um, so sometimes they're sometimes they're made up quotes from this fake radio show, and then sometimes they're real ones. So you, um, I'm sure you you were thinking to yourself, well, sometimes I need to put some kind of information in there, and sometimes, you know, maybe just a fun quote, right? You know? Well, you're giving, you're giving me too much credit. Actually, it went like this. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Frank Herbert's Dune series. And you know how at the beginning of each of his chapters, yep. in, you know, there was something from the um, Benary Jesuit or something like this and yeah. talking about backstory. I loved that. I thought that was so cool. And so I said, I'm going to do that. And then I started realizing, hey, you know what? I can tell two stories at once. I could tell the story in the in the in the chapter blurbs, and I can tell a story from Ben Mason's point of view, thus giving the reader a bigger story. So mm -hmm. I was I was a post genius, right? Well, and and um, yeah. So the next thing I had dog eared was uh, was about um, you know the uh, the discovery that things were happening in other cities that Seattle was gone and those kinds of things. And we kind of already addressed like the things happening off camera. So that was really the next thing that I was going. I, I got ahead of myself and already asked that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the the trick with the, the quotes at the beginning, and yeah, I, I see what you're saying with Dune. Um, I'm a big Dune fan myself. Um, and also, it was an interesting choice um, to have the final stand happen at Kilimanjaro. Um, and it was funny because um, a guy whose radio show I listen to every morning had just gotten back from doing Kilimanjaro, like, when I was reading this, and so, um, I might have gotten you a sale out of that, um, because <laughs> I tweeted at him, like, I'm reading this book, um, 
alien invasion uh, comes to a head at, at Kilimanjaro. And um, w- I'm wondering uh, why specifically, I mean, there's all, there's lots of different monuments and places that you could have could have put the end at. Um, what, was it Hemingway? Yeah, <laughs> it was Hemingway. Yeah, okay. I th- I wondered if that was, like, um, just a big fan of the snows of Kilimanjaro and wanting to I, capture that I'm a big fan of Hemingway, and, and I wanted to kind of tie in. Um, there's a couple passages in, in the snows of Kilimanjaro that I didn't copy, mm-hmm. but I kind of homaged in, in there because I wanted to bring some of that oeuvre into great life, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, hey, and, I, and I'm wondering, and I, I know a little bit about this, but what has the reaction been from en, um, enlisted men? I'm sure uh, military sci-fi gets heavy readership from people that are actually still in the military. Have you gotten any feedback yet? On, on oh, yeah, this series? I've gotten tons of feedback. Um, um, it's all been positive. I've not received a single, a single negative piece of feedback from a lot of... Uh, from a lot of military, a lot of ex-military, a lot of um, gun porn addicts who I have a lot of friends who, who are gun porn addicts, um, um, and just just a lot of folks in general. Probably David, probably the most intriguing um, comment I got. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know about the character Michelle and how and how she's broken and she's a cutter. Yeah. And, and I got an email through my website from uh, a guy who's a fan. And he said he loved it, and he thanked me because he said, for the first time, he understands why his daughter um, is hurting herself. And he he asked her to read this passage that Michelle said, and um, and she read it. And he said, yeah, he's right. That that that's exactly the reason why I do it. And I was humbled, just, just amazingly humbled, that you know this guy sent me this email thanking me because. Uh, through this piece of let's let's just call it what it is pop fiction, you know he was able to together a deeper understanding about what what's troubling his daughter and maybe grasp onto a better way to um, um, work it out. And so all of the responses I've had were good. All of them were excellent. Um, I, I, I I'm sure there are negative comments out there, but I haven't heard one. Right. Well, um, and. I gotta say too, like one thing I, I have to admit to is that um, I am not a huge fan of first person. I like to write in third person, um, and I get like me personally. One of the reasons I don't like to write in first person is I feel like it takes some of the suspense away, just in the sense that you know the characters are are, are the main character at least is going to survive to tell the story, and I know that's not always true. And I'm not, I've never been anti first person. There's plenty of first person books I like. Um, and some of the best first person narratives are like Dolores Claiborne, for example, I think is amazing. And one of the things that's cool about this book is that I, I admit with just my prejudice against first person, when I started reading it, I, I said to myself, oh, Weston, I wouldn't have done this in first person. And then <laughs> by a third of the way through, I was so happy that it was in first person because of the narrow focus of it. And um, so I began to ride with it. And one of the things that I, I wanted to give you a compliment on, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about the writing process of this book, is because I thought the first person was done extremely well. And so I wanted to be up front and say, like, like when I say that the first person is done well, I really mean it. <laughs> Can I tell you a secret? Sure. This is the first novel I've ever done first person. Right. And did you? I've done, I've done a few short stories first person, but but normally I'm like you. Yeah, I'm a third person guy. Yeah. Well, SEAL Team moves all over the place too, um, and kind it, of. Has I just to. wrote. It it has to. Uh, I just wrote and turned in. Um, a novel to Solaris called Burning Sky that I wrote it in a very interesting way. I wrote it in third person, but I wrote it with such a close POV that it really could be first person. Yeah, well, you know, I I think you always have to get into the headspace of your characters, whether you're in first or third person. That's a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, 
but I think this novel really and, and really does benefit from the narrow focus of the first person. So that's part of it. Okay. You know, you're, you're asking me about challenges early on, and, and I, I remember one of my challenges in first person was, you know, I, I'm an absolute believer in every every major character has to have a character arc. They have to begin somewhere, go through conflict, and, and change, end up somewhere else. Well, that's a right? fundamental storytelling. It, it should yeah. be. <laughs> but, but, you know, how, how do you do these other characters' arcs when you're not in their headspace? And that was a little bit hard. Uh, I had to... Um, I had to do a lot of it through dialogue, as you as you know, and uh, mm -hmm. so that so that you could know how, what they were thinking and how they were changing. Um, and I uh, so, and I would imagine that that meant that Benjamin Mason, as a main character, had to be more empathetic than maybe he would have been otherwise, just to be able to catch on to the arcs of the main characters, because we have to see the arcs develop through him in this yep. sense. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and and really, I think you did, it, especially with Michelle um, as a character. Was the the arc was fantastic um, with her. And uh, okay, so there's a line towards the end. No, I'm um, that I want to talk about. Um, and you know, I underline, and we're all the way on page um, four fourteen. So we're very close to the end. And I underlined the, the line, you're just a fucking grunt, aren't you? But more importantly, two paragraphs down is Mason saying to himself, no, the Cray aren't our enemy. They were just grunts following orders. They'd come here and fought at somebody else's bidding. And I know this has been done maybe before in military sci-fi, but after building up so much hatred and anger towards these characters to realize I, that was a huge part of the end of the book was, um, it was us figuring out that, you know, they're grunts too. And so I haven't read book two or three yet. I will soon, but, um, I'm assuming that the, grunt aspect of it, we're going to get more into the grunt life that our enemies, in this sense, are living, right? Um, yes, you are. Um, uh, you are. And, and there was some indication that, uh, and, and there were some conversations that a lot of the characters had, because these creatures, as dangerous and as deadly as they are, they're kind of one-trick ponies. You know, they were, they were designed to come down here destroy your infrastructure, and that's about all they could do. And it, it makes you wonder what, what's next. So it, it became clear towards the end that, that they were here for that specific reason. Um, and, you know, I wrote this book while I was in Afghanistan, believe it or not, in 2013. And when, when we're sitting behind our desks or in front of our TVs, um, 8,000 miles away from war, uh, and, and looking at the Taliban, and looking at the, the, the fighters up in the hills, um, and looking at, at these people who, who, many of which are just, are just fighting just to get us out of there. You know, you can call them what you want, whatever name you want, but they're just trying to get us out of there. From, from this distance, they look like terrorists, and they look like, um, you know, just evil people. But when you're, you know, street level with a madman like that, and you're, you're right near them, you get a different focus, because you, you kind of understand that you're on their soil. They just want, want you to get the hell out. Just like... If we had if we had people in Tennessee or in Georgia, you know, there would be hill 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 people out there doing the same thing to them. Because I live in Tennessee, I know I know the way we are, and um, uh, so I wanted that to come through in the book too. That that yeah, that they're enemies. You know, we don't like them. You know, they, they killed our friends, but on on one level, they're just like us. They're, they're just, just grunts who 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 are told to do something, who are who are protecting their friends, and um, uh, you know, doing whatever they can to get to get by. Well, and and I think this is just a really smart, um, it's a really smart book uh, from beginning to end, and that's one of the reasons why I was excited to talk to you about it. Now, uh, I'm going to try to wrap this up because we've been talking for a little while. But um, one of the first times we talked about this, these books before I read, uh, before I actually read Grunt Life. Um, 
you mentioned to me when we were at Mysterious Galaxies that Grunt Life was much more of a formed trilogy. How much, uh, how much of a difference in how you what what was the difference in how you built a trilogy on purpose for the Grunt books as opposed to SEAL Team Six Six Six, which I'm a mad from what I got from our conversation was is that you didn't really plan out the trilogy as much. Like, what did, did you learn between the two? Well, the only cohesive thread that goes from book one to book three in the SEAL Team um, series is uh, the main character's relationship with, with his girlfriend, who's also an analyst with CIA. That's, that's, the, that's the one main thread. Everything else is just like... Just, Standalone. You know, yeah, one book takes place in Asia, one book takes place in Mexico, the third book takes place in, in, um, in England. But that third book, ooh, I've had people punch me for that third book. Because I do, I do some terrible things in that to include turning King Arthur into a white supremacist. So, um, okay. that being said... That being I, have said read, I have read the controversy. I'm excited to read that one. <laughs> <laughs> having, 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 um, or having said that, it's really just three books in a series. It's much like, you know, the old um, Badlands series where you have one adventure, another adventure, another adventure. Yes, but that's what they are. And they're good. I like them. But I just didn't realize as I was writing them that I, I wasn't doing it right. So when I sat down with Grunt Life, I, 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 I absolutely wanted it to be this, this major arc. And it actually became fairly easy. Because once I decided that they're going to destroy the Earth, or pretty much as much of it as, as they can, then at that point I have I have my arc. Because in the in the first book, you know they win a battle, but they lose the war. Right. The humans do. Um, the second book, you're going to find out uh, the other shoes are going to start dropping, and and more things are going to start happening. And then and then by the by the third book. Um, it's it's no longer about rebuilding. It's about revenge, because uh, Ben Mason is pissed off. He's mad. He's angry, and he doesn't he doesn't care about rebuilding anything because really nothing can be rebuilt anymore. It's been so utterly destroyed. He just wants to get back at whoever the head effing alien it is. Right. Well, and um, man, uh, well, and it just it just seems like for, like did you plan the trilogy from the beginning as a um, act one, act two, act three, or, and then divide into kind of doing acts within the books, or was it one at a time? It uh, was one at a time. I, yeah. I do broadly what I wanted to do with like books two and three. Um, but uh, I, I was very lucky with this publisher, Solaris. I had worked with them in a bad, when, when the editor was at a bad in books. Mm -hmm. And and that's and that's a work for hire imprint where I did um, a post-apocalyptic novel called Blood Ocean and my only zombie novel called Empire Salt, and it's flat rate and and uh, but it has huge distribution, just yeah. huge distribution. They're very popular. So uh, I worked with him on those two books, and, and I think he got a sense for me that uh, that he knows that that I'm a, a I'm an on-time writer. I'm a good writer. Um, I respond to edits. Uh, I'm not an asshole when it comes to those, and uh, and and the book comes out good. So, normally when you write a novel um, on spec, or I mean when when you write a novel for a contract, the publisher wants at least a ten-page outline about what's going on. Um, but he didn't ask me for this because he knew that I had already outlined and, I, and I, I'd already worked for him. So for book one, I gave him a paragraph. Mm -hmm. For book two, I gave him, I gave him. A sentence for book three, I gave him one word: revenge, and <laughs> and, and that and that was my guiding principle. Right. Well, yeah. Okay. So to close this out, um, what would be as what would you say is? And I know you've got a whole career of lessons that you <laughs> things you've learned, but specifically in this book. What do you think you learned most writing this particular book that led to um, more strength when you went to write book two in the series? 
Um, cause I feel like I know for me, every book that I write, I learn a ton with each one that I'm writing. And I'm just wondering on this specific book, what, 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 what did you take away from it? Just from my perspective, if somebody's reading it, I want, I'm just interested in that. Um, you know, it's something I learned writing, writing the SEAL team books and, and I'm getting better as it, as I go along, but it's not to be a, not to be afraid to include pop culture, not to be afraid to include um, uh, comic books and book books and TV shows, because the more a, a reader can read a character that is more relatable to them, the more they like it and, and the more they get into the story. I mean, in, in SEAL Team 666, I have the, this huge conversation about how 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 Superman should be fat and how it's totally unrealistic and how and how Batman should, you know should should be the stronger of the two, um, and everybody who reads it and wants to comment to me they're like you're totally right. But see they enjoy, they enjoy that because it's it's things that they can relate to, which is why I included all these books by all these really super famous um, sci-fi authors and and you know every so often they they come up again because you know. What would John Stakely do in this point? You know, what 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 would William Shatner do? Which right. For the joke, joking thing, but I I learned to trust myself to include those more, and I think it reads better with them than without. Now, in in forty years, if somebody picks up Grunt Lives, is it going to be dated? Yes. Okay, but I'm not writing it to be read in forty years. I'm writing I, I'm I'm writing it to be to be read now, and if it if it does if in forty years people are still reading it. And, and they say it's dated, I'll say thank you very much for reading it 40 years after you published. Right. Well, I, uh, John Shirley and I have gone, uh, had many discussions about, because he likes to update his old books, and um, I, I like them the way they are. <laughs> I like my sci-fi outdated sometimes. Like I think it's um, refreshing to see where the author was at the time and like where their science fiction brain was working. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I love going back and read old Heinlein and, and Bradbury books. I love those because, you know, the, the science is not, not anywhere near what they thought it was going to be. But, right. you know, they're, they're honest and they're charming. Yeah. Well, and, you know, in some books, like, just hold up amazingly well. Like, I think one of the authors I think holds up better than John Bruner. Like, his books just, like, blow me away how much they hold up from the 70s, you know. Um, it's just crazy. All right. Well, Weston, it was awesome talking to you about this book. Um, I will, uh, definitely keep in touch when I, uh, when I get around to, to the other books. Um, this is a, a really cool series. I really, uh, dig that the PTSD, um, I think the thing that is most impressive to me about this book is how the PTSD aspect of it spins on the classic um, dirty dozen thing. I think I was 150 pages in or something when I figured out that's what you were doing, and I, I was re reading it on the bus, and I literally fist bumped or fist pumped, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> yes, that's so smart, it's so genius. Um, I love it, and so um, and so whenever a, an author can can get me to do that, I, I just uh, I want to show my appreciation. Oh, uh, thank so. you, man. I appreciate that. All right, well, I'm going to, so uh, later, folks.